Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce you to a friend of mine who's a sister in Christ. Some of you may know her from her podcast, Tulips and Honey. Lauren Herford is with me today. And this is something that I've been wanting to do since I first met her is, is interview her about her testimony. Just a little context. Uh, we're filming this on April 16th, 2020. We're both in lockdown mode. Uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, and yeah. and your husband, he's is he on the front line? Isn't he a respiratory therapist? Yeah, he sure is. Yep, he's a respiratory therapist. So he works primarily. He works in the NICU, but if there is a need for the um, COVID patients, if there's not somebody else that's there that's able to do it, there are several cases of COVID um, patients in his in his personal, like in the hospital here um, in North Dakota there hasn't been just a huge amount of cases here. So we were surprised by how many of them are in the hospital and staying. Um, I'm not, he hasn't mentioned any of them having left yet. So mm. the hospital's on lockdown and they're definitely being very careful. And a really surprising thing for me, Doreen, is that the age range, we keep hearing that it's only affecting um, elderly people, but they're, he's treating patients up there from like 30 plus. Oh, wow. So there's a greater age range that he's actually seeing from patients that are mm -hmm. coming in. So yeah, he's, he's in there. He's, he's doing this work. I'm so proud to have my husband be, um, I mean, I'm always proud of my mm -hmm. husband. He's always saving lives. It's his job on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's been, it's been interesting to have to scrub him down with Lysol though, when he walks yes. in the door each morning. Oh, I'm but. glad he's staying safe and he has masks and protective equipment. Okay. Yeah, we're very blessed here. There's just, there hasn't been the huge overflow that there has mm -hmm. been in other cities. Um, one particular friend of mine from, from Michigan, his wife is sewing masks for their local hospital because oh. they're out. Wow. So uh, I know that there are other cities that are way, way more packed with these, these issues. But here mm -hmm. he's got the full hazmat, um, the oh, PPE, good. I think they call yeah. it. And although they are having to continuously use their masks, they can't mm -hmm. take them off and throw them away and put on a new one. They, sure. they use the same one. Mm -hmm. But at least they, they've drawn funny faces on them and stuff to make it less Aww. scary for the kids. <laughs> so yeah, we're pretty blessed yeah. up here. Oh, well, we'll be praying for both of you. That's wonderful that he's out there helping. Thank you. I appreciate those prayers. We both do. It's, it's been very overwhelming, the amount of support and prayers that we get. It's, it's just overwhelming. Oh, I can imagine. Well, let's talk about you. And uh, you have a very interesting upbringing. I kind of relate to it because uh, your mom was kind of your spiritual leader, as was mine in our family. And, uh, and so when you were a child, you were telling me that she raised you in Wicca. Yes. Yeah. So it was, it was really scary. It was a scary way to be raised. I know that there's, there's a lot of other way worse ways to grow up. So I'm definitely not saying that mine is, is the most difficult childhood, but we did have a, um, my dad was an alcoholic. So at six, he left, they divorced. And I had this really weird issue between six and eight. I have no memories. So hmm. for whatever reason, as a kid, my brain was just like, nope. And so those memories are tucked away. So I actually don't remember like the first time she started practicing this, but I know at eight years old, um, she, she took us over to my aunt's house. We lived with my aunt and uncle for a couple of years. And during that time, she was trying to get off of drugs and alcohol. And unfortunately, she struggled with that a lot afterwards. And I'm not sure if that lends itself to this, but definitely at the age of 10, when she came back for us, she was practicing and it progressed quickly from 10 to 12. Um, I, she had the books in the house. There was crystals. There was an encouragement for me to write my own spells and, and things to that nature. And it was always a difficult thing to sleep in a house like that. You, you open those doors to these things. And I mean, I guess growing up, I just thought we had ghosts, but now I know better that that's not actually the case. And so yeah, between 10 years old and 14 years old, there was just nonstop chaos in our house, things happening, moving, breaking, growls, hor horrible things. Um, and of course, really frightening nightmares and things to that nature. But at 14, actually, she met a friend of mine's parent and we all started going to church together. And so she, she had, I remember she told me she had opened up the Bible and it was the first time in a long time because she actually called herself a Wiccan Christian. So she oh, believed in Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus and the goddesses at the same time. So do you think she was following the false Jesus that's prophesied? 
Yeah, absolutely. I do. I, I, she Mm -hmm. had absolutely no, um, reference. She Mm -hmm. just heard of Jesus. So she knew there was, you know, this religion called Christianity, but she didn't have any sort of actual background in her mind frame for it, but we had a Bible and Mm -hmm. she opened it up directly to the old Testament where it rebukes witchcraft. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) interesting. Deuteronomy 18 then, huh? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. And then she slammed it shut, threw it back in the, in the drawer where it was at. And I think that that sort of began working on her where she was able to say, wait, no, these don't go together. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't practice witchcraft and also call yourself a Christian. You have to choose. And so while she's wrestling with these ideas and all this crazy stuff is happening in the house, my friend's mom invites her to church with us. Unfortunately, it was a very new age church. Oh no. So Yeah. There was no gospel message being presented and it was, it was, full Bethel style church. Of course, I, I hadn't heard of Bethel and it wasn't popular at that time. This has been almost 20 years ago, but she on her own was studying scripture. So even though she wasn't getting it at, at church, she would go home and just pour through scripture trying to oh, understand. Wow. And so eventually she made a profession, profession of faith and she was baptized and they baptized me alongside her. I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why it was a good idea to proclaim me saved as well, but they did. I was, I was a a Christian alongside her. And so her life dramatically changed after that. You know, she still to this day struggles with the alcohol, but she never again struggled with meth. And so at that point, she threw away everything that she had that was related to um, Wiccan. I I mean, she even changed like furniture out in the house, Mm -hmm. anything that reminded her of the things that she would have been a part of lamps that she bought that looked like globes and things that nature. I mean, she got rid of everything. It was, it was like a purging of the whole house, but the, the frightening stuff kept happening. We would move to see if that would help. We had people from churches come and try to anoint the house and things like that. Um, That stuff just continued and continued until I, I actually got married and moved out. But at least at that point, she was no longer practicing witchcraft. Mm -hmm. So that did change a lot of things that were happening, at least in our personal lives together. And she, she was able to come out of all of that. But for me personally, this was just, okay, one less thing to have to worry about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, that is interesting. So um, having been in that atmosphere, and I don't know, did she get you to practice? You said she asked you to make your own spells. Were you involved in Wicca yourself? Yeah, I didn't understand any of it at the time as a little kid, but it sure sounded great. It sounded really cool that I could make things change Mm -hmm. based on, and there was so many shows and movies like Charmed and things, things to that Mm -hmm. nature that, that made you feel like this was so just cool and not scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, normal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so anytime she, you know, she worked two to three jobs as a single mom. She was, she was out of the house a lot. I just helped myself to any of the stuff that she'd bought, the books, the, the different, the different, you know, leaving your body and stuff like that. And, and the crystals and stuff there, they were all there available for me Mm -hmm. if I needed them or wanted to mess with them. There was never any sort of like, you have to do this, you have to practice this, but there was also like a don't touch my stuff. Like that Mm -hmm. never happened. So I would, yeah. And if I, if I ever mentioned it to her, she would help me like what I needed to say and things like that. And I I do remember those moments where I was just like, Hey, I, you know, I have this issue going on at school and uh, you know, what do you got in those books? That's Mm going to help with that. Mm -hmm. But just as a, as a teenager, it was, it was, it was just cool to me. I thought it was really cool. And my friends would come over and we would talk about, you know, ghosts and Ouija boards and stuff like that. And, and as a kid, I, I did, so admire my mom to, to an extent, especially being away from her for those two years when I was at my aunt's, that was uh, between eight and 10. I had a Barbie doll that looked just like her and I would Mm. keep it with me everywhere I went. And when she cut her hair, if I saw her at Christmas, I would cut my Barbie doll's hair to match hers. So Mm. that really affected my, uh, my abilities to reason logically through what I was being told. It didn't matter if it was accurate or reasonable. Yeah. It was coming from her. And so coming from her meant it was true. Mm-hmm. So that I think that also leading into Christianity was the same. So, okay. She says, we're going to be Christians. Now we're going to church. I'm a Christian. Now I'm going to church. But you didn't really understand either. It doesn't sound like you really understood Wicca. You didn't understand Christianity. It, it sounded like it was more like being with your mom. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just 
no understanding and no real desire to understand mm-hmm. at the time. I just really wanted to uh, make her make her happy to please her. And so I didn't I didn't question it. Mm-hmm. But I also didn't really dig into anything. I wasn't trying to like understand the forces of nature or anything like that. I just assumed it was true. And, and that if I couldn't make it work, it was something wrong with me. Okay. So it, and, it really didn't go deeper. Did you have paranormal experiences during that time? Yes. Oh my goodness. That, this is, if I could get anything through to your listeners, the one warning that I would say is it, even if you just think it's a cute show or something like that, this, we were tormented as kids. I didn't sleep alone until I was late into my teens. I couldn't sleep in a room by myself. I struggled in school because we weren't sleeping at night mm. um, because there was a constant stream of noises happening, knocking and, and banging and things being pushed over and, and all sorts of things happening around us that lights flashing where there's no windows to, to show a light through and things would th- things would happen that were just terrifying to a kid you know you you just Mm -hmm. as an adult if something similar to that would happen to me now I haven't had to deal with it of course as an adult but as an adult I wouldn't care because I would just be like okay well you know there's really nothing you can do but as a kid you hear growling you wake up with scratches all over your body I mean it's really frightening oh so so you had you had we did struggle you had scratches on your body yes all the time we would wake up with scratches on our arms and our legs or backs yeah, we all did. Yeah, she struggled with that too. And and what do you oh. think it is now, looking back? What do you think was happening? Oh, I, I 100% think it was demonic. It's just demonic. So any, if you open that door to mm-hmm. this realm, and that's their that's their kingdom. That's you know where they get to do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And of course, God is sovereign. And um, and we were never harmed in a way where it was like oh no, now we have to go to the emergency room, but definitely bright red whelps, you know, in different, different areas and stuff. Mm. And it's, it's a shame that, that this is something people invite into their own lives yeah. and into their, their houses, but it's, it is, it's very popular. What was Harry Potter a part of your upbringing? You know, Harry Potter was, was popular when I was about 12. So right mm-hmm. around the time when things were shifting, Okay. That was a thing where, where the, the books had been out, but the movies weren't big yet. Mm-hmm. I think if they had been big earlier, it would have been a lot more difficult to logically think through these things. But mm-hmm. the, the, real, the real thing I think that pushed her was probably charmed. I think that would be the biggest influence on her was here's sisters and they're happy and everything is okay and they're fighting evil. And I think she saw these things happening around us as the evil that she was supposed to be fighting as a mom. And so instead of pushing her away from these things, it pushed her further into it. How can I make this stop as, you know, as a mom Mm -hmm. and we would move all the time, Doreen, we moved so many times. It never helped. It followed us everywhere we went. Mm -hmm. We had, and we had so many animals in the house at any given time. So they're, the animals are getting freaked out by the sounds. And you had a lot of pets. We did. We had a lot of pets. We all had our own cat and our own dog. And then if there were strays, my, my mom was the kind of person, if you, if you needed the shirt off her back, she would give it to you. And we, we were dirt poor. We're like, not just a little bit poor, but like our groceries came from the local churches kind of poor. So right. she would, she'd get these groceries from the local church and then she would split them with other people in the neighborhood that also needed help. So oh, she wow. was a, a very kind, very loving person. If there was a stray that needed to help help the house, she would, whether it was a person or an animal, (laughs) she Uh would give it a home. And so she really was trying to the best of her own sinful fallen ability to be, um, to be a good mom and a good person. But the more she put effort into this, the the more it would, the more it would expand into worse and worse difficulties. It sounds like you were saying that she thought she was combating evil by practicing Wicca. Is, Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, yeah. because Wicca is becoming more and more popular. And what do you see the difference being between Wicca and witchcraft? Or is there a difference? I'm, I'm sure that there's a difference in the actual names that, that are given to, to goddesses. I think the, the big difference that you see in Wicca is just that there's, there's like a hierarchy. They have specific goddesses that they worship. There's, it's not just, I can maneuver things. Because there there's a, a smaller branch of witchcraft behavior out there that really is sort of like agnostic in its own beliefs that they're not saying, Oh, there's a, you know, a goddess in the moon that's helping me. 
they just don't really care about what sort of deity is out there. They're just practicing whatever witchcraft they've stumbled onto. So there's, there's the Wiccan practice where there's actually deities. And then there's, there's the other versions out there that mm-hmm. I think are just, they're, they're not popular because everybody wants to worship something. Mm. So if you don't have that image, that deity to worship, then, then you're really not fulfilling that desire. So I think mm-hmm. the baseline witchcraft stuff that we see out there, it's, it's very connected to a lot of the feminist movement that we see. I was going to ask you, yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of the yeah. women that I've met who are into Wicca and witchcraft have been terribly hurt by men, um, boyfriends, Absolutely. husbands, father, and so they reject Christianity just because it's, they say it's too male, it's too patriarchal. Mm-hmm. And so they go to more of a goddess worship, um, which, which seems logical until you really see that those are not goddesses, those are demons. Right. Very frightening, very frightening. Not at all like the really beautiful pictures that you might no, see. Of them. No, no. And I apologize that I was a part of that for a while and have repented have please forgive me if you had my goddess cards they were something that i didn't understand at the time it sounds like your mom too had good intentions just didn't understand it yeah i mean in our carnal our carnal situation that we're in before salvation your your brain just is not it's not going to be able to pull from you know the sovereignty of god or scripture anything other than carnality and I know that I've heard from so many, just to be an encouragement to you, I'm sure you hear this all the time. I hear from people who say, you know what, I was in the new age right alongside Doreen. And then she started talking about Christianity and I got saved. Mm. So I'm getting these messages no, okay. and I'm not even you. So well, I can't even God. imagine. Yeah. Uh, praise yeah. God for that. So it's, yeah. I it's love how he purpose. uses my testimony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I pray that, pe- that God uses this testimony too, for those who are dabbling or especially those who are influencing their children. And mm-hmm. it seems so innocent, like Harry Potter, like Ouija right. boards, like cards. Um, you know, I see this on Instagram all the time, mothers with just beautiful babies introducing them to new age and, and mm-hmm. Wicca and witchcraft. And, and so, you know, as a mom, you, you want the best for your kid and you think this is the best, but then as Lauren's describing, it's, it's with that, there's a big price to pay for this. Absolutely. I mean, seriously, praise the Lord for saving you and getting you out of that. Um, you were saying though, that the first church you went to was, didn't have the gospel, didn't, right. didn't lead to salvation. Was it um, entertainment driven or seeker friendly or what was going on there? You know, it, it was really one of the the type of sort of non-denominational Pentecostal churches that we we saw quite a bit in the 90s there. Those churches now today are really just all about the seeker-driven entertainment. But at the time, they were very passionate about the new age stuff that they were entering into this. And and so for my mom, as she's learning and she's growing in, in, in scripture, she starts noticing these things. She starts mentioning them to me. And Eventually, but she's what like, are examples to... of, of the new age things you saw in that church? So a lot of it was things like your Holy Spirit telepathy stuff to that nature where they're taking these words where, yeah, if you're praying, you want to make sure that you're leaving your body and you're, you know, entering into the spirit realm and stuff, stuff like that. Now, I was in the youth at the time, so I wasn't in the actual service hearing these things. So we, we didn't have Sunday service with the adults and we didn't have Wednesday service with the adults. They mm. shipped us right out into a different building. And, and what would you learn in that building? Oh, you know, it was all about like how to be a teenager that wasn't falling for promiscuity or mm. drugs. Mm-hmm. It was never an actual scriptural, like, here's your scripture for today. This is what we're going to learn about. It was very, that, that version, I think, would, I would say seeker friendly for teenagers. Very cool, very hip. You had like, you know, your lights turned down low and your smog machines and stuff like that. So they made that portion of it very cool. Whereas my mom was dealing with this, this new age stuff, but I loved it. I, you know, obviously I'm having a blast. I had a lot of friends there. Um, I'm not hearing about my sin, so I'm not feeling convicted for anything. You know, I'm just pretty much being told to tote the line. As long as people are watching, that's what I could do. Um, obviously in my own thought life and in my own personal life, I was a, a wretched sinner as wretched as any teenager can be. But I, I mean, I've disrespected my mom. I talked back, I argued, um, I was lazy in my studies. <laughs> and so, um, 
I wasn't learning about any of that. But as soon as she started pushing back, the pastor essentially said, listen, like it or, or leave it. Mm. And she continued to, to say, you know, I'm really just concerned about this. Maybe you could help me understand. He spread the rumor among the adults that she had been a uh, witch before coming there. So I wasn't allowed to play with any of the kids anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> so we left that church after that and ended up in a great Baptist church where they were really teaching scripture. Even mm-hmm. in the youth group, there was, te- there was scriptural teaching, which I was just like completely checked out at, at the time. I was just, wow, you know, where's the pizza and okay. the video games? You know, it was, okay. it was a big difference. But we mm-hmm. unfortunately didn't get to stay there long as my grandma got sick and we, we moved to her town to help take care of her. Mm-hmm. And she was going to a Pentecostal church. Oh, okay. So we ended up in that Pentecostal church where there's, there was a good deal more scriptural teaching there than there was the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still hadn't heard the gospel at, to, at that point. I hadn't heard the gospel. Now I'm sure that my mom believing that I was saved, didn't feel the need to like explain what she had learned. Mm-hmm. Maybe she thought they had already taught me that in, um, in the youth group. And that's why she didn't feel the need to like fill me in on what sin was. But as I got older and older, you know, she could tell that there was, there was an issue. There was something here that was wrong, but she just, all the things that she would try to say, it sort of went in one ear and out the other. Mm. And, and so I just kind of lived a double life. Mm. I behaved like they wanted me to behave at church. And then whenever I wasn't at church, did whatever I wanted. And if that was drinking, I never did drugs, but um, I'd stay out late at night with my friends and we'd just go drive around and we were big dorks. So we played at playgrounds like dorks do <laughs> and, uh, like never anything serious, but just not, not behaving like, like a young lady should be. And yes. so I still, at that point, I, I never had heard the gospel. I got married at 20. Mm-hmm. I still hadn't heard the gospel. I met my husband at church. Mm. We got married at that church and I still hadn't heard the gospel. Mm. A couple of years later, we had my, my daughter. She's Kay- Kaylee, she was beautiful. She changed my husband's life like instantly. As soon as she was born, he just melted from this tough guy to um, daddy bear now. Like, no. <laughs> and so suddenly he had questions and he wanted the answers to his questions. He was raised Pentecostal and none of it made any sense to him. I had learned already. You don't ask questions. I learned that whenever we got kicked out of that first church, you don't ask mm. questions at church. People won't like you. You got you kicked out from that first church. That first church, yeah, they were well, like... Well, they, they shunned you, it sounds like. Shunned, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, mm-hmm. I wasn't personally asked to leave, but the last time I went, um, I went for a youth event and only one person talked to me the whole oh, time. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, maybe we that's... better not. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's like, maybe we better not come back here to this, this church again, but... yeah. You know, it was, it was uh, difficult. It was very hurtful to have friends sending me messages talking about how, you know, they were learning witchcraft that night thinking it was like a funny joke. And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what's even going on, how everybody found out. So mm-hmm. yeah, we were, I don't know if we were formal, if she was formally asked to leave or not, but I know for sure that some of the women started sharing that yeah. um, she was a witch and things like that nature. And and so um, we, we got out of there and the next church, if I bet if we had stayed longer than a couple of weeks, I probably would have eventually heard the gospel there, mm-hmm. but we didn't stay long enough. Um, and then we moved again and again and again, a couple of different times and getting married. And my husband's asking these questions and I don't know any of these answers. And I'm like, I, you know, don't rock the boat. <laughs> don't. Mm. But it's not good enough for him. He was very um, inquisitive. He wanted to understand why the things that they were teaching us weren't really happening in in real life. You know, they're telling us in these Pentecostal churches that we should be speaking in tongues. We should be Mm -hmm. healing people and we should be, you know, raising people from the dead. We're not seeing any of that. And he's like, listen, when Kaylee gets a few years older, she's going to ask you these questions too. What are you going to say? And I was like, oh, Mm mm-hmm. I don't have yeah. any of those answers. So we yeah. started looking. Because Pentecostal, um, um, the, the foundation of them is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the second baptism. And that the sign of the, that you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved, according to the Pentecostal right. foundation. And so Absolutely. Was, is that something you got yeah. involved in? Mm-hmm. And 
and so you were speaking in tongues and others I were never, I never spoke in tongues okay I'm sure I must have looked like a complete heathen to them but mm -hmm. I I just didn't I, I thought if it's gonna happen it's gonna happen for real and so I'm just gonna wait and see and and I thought everybody around me was being genuine. I think there's a lot of manipulation that happens in that. There's a lot of um, psychological psychological stuff that they're using to create those sort of behaviorisms. But I I was at that point just completely and totally oblivious. I I didn't want to know why I wasn't like everybody else. I just wanted to fit in and just not not be. Um, not be ridiculed. I didn't want to have the same thing happen over and over again. And so I didn't ask any questions, but if, when people prayed, I bowed my head and I didn't, I didn't say anything whenever everybody was speaking in tongues, but I never had a moment where I fell over. I never had a moment where I was, you know, filled with the Holy spirit. Yeah. And I know that that's just God's providential protection. My husband never had either any of those experiences, but the problem is, is that by this time, in the in the Pentecostal church, so we got we got married in the in the early two thousands. Mm -hmm. By that time, the Pentecostal churches had decided that they needed to be more seeker friendly too, mm -hmm. and so they're not pushing the um, speaking in tongues mm -hmm. as much as mm -hmm. they were originally. Whenever I first started going, that was one of the first things somebody told me: you need to pray out loud in a whisper so that you'll receive this the, the spirit. Someone told me that, and I remember thinking that's not in scripture. But I didn't say anything. <laughs> but uh, I know that at this point, you get into these churches, if they're not pushing it anymore, and you're a kid and a teenager, and you're looking around, and you're like, this is kind of, this is kind of uncomfortable for you as, as a teenager. So that was my experience with it. I know there's a lot of, a lot of my friends at the time that were speaking in tongues, and, and they were being slain in the Holy Spirit. And I don't know how much of that was manipulation and how mm -hmm. much of it is just, listen, my parents are not going to leave me alone about this. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of pressure. So, yeah. I'm sure that it was, I'm sure that it was a little bit of both, but the music that, that we see in those big churches, they're doing that in the little churches too. They're mm -hmm. playing music repeatedly over and over again. And after an hour of the same rhythmic music, anybody's brain is going to kind of shut down a sure. little bit. And, yeah. And you go into more. a trance. Exactly. Yeah. And you've done, you've done videos about that that were so helpful for me to understand mm -hmm. why it is that that was happening to people. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of neurological issues that I think sort of put up some blockers for that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you know, God's providence for, for my broken stuff in my brain actually might've helped in those situations because yes. the less shut down my, my brain is supposed to be, it actually fires up even more. So when everybody else is all subdued and being quiet, mm -hmm. I've got like eight things going on in my brain. I'm playing a movie and I'm listening to a different song <laughs> and I'm having a conversation. <laughs> so maybe that's why I never was, was able to do that. Could be. Yeah, but it worked for my advantage, I guess. So, I mean, it was, it was good in that light, but my mom also never, um, I never saw her spoke, speak in tongues while we were going and and, and again, you know, I really was doing what she wanted me to do. And if I didn't see her do it, it probably had another bit of influence for it. But eventually we, we found our way to traveling. Um, we're, we're traveling respiratory therapists. Well, my husband is, I just travel with him mm -hmm. and that, that changed everything as well. So now we're packing up, we're leaving everything behind, including our family's influence. So my husband's family is very Pentecostal. And so that's where a lot of the, the influence was coming from. And once we started traveling, my daughter was three and, and we're, we're away from that. Now we're having to make our own opinions. What, what churches are we going to go to? And there was a particularly difficult day. We went on Easter to a new church in, in, in um, Bremerton, Washington, which is okay. right across the way from Seattle. It's uh -huh. really beautiful. And the church talked about um, the reasons why you should believe Jesus existed. And I'm sure that that's a great sermon for people who are saved and they're just looking for apologetics. But as we were walking out, my husband was like, I'm not going back to church. So don't ask me to go back to church. I'm not going to go back to church. None of these people believe what, what they're teaching because they're not acting like the Bible says we're supposed to act. Mm. And that was really hard to hear because I believed at that time to be a Christian meant you went to church. Yes. Right. You had to check mark those boxes. Or else people wouldn't believe you that well, you were. Well, I mean, there is biblical basis for that. We are commanded right. to fellowship in corporate worship. So, yeah, you know. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we fellowship as as believers. We know that that's a command. Mm -hmm. I believed that the the trips to church were what was saving me. 
That's oh, what made Okay, so it's legalism. Yeah. Legalism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had never even been taught that. I don't I still to this day have no idea where those ideas came from. Mm-hmm. But you know, I thought if you didn't go to church that you weren't saved and you weren't you weren't gonna get to go to heaven. Right. So for it was it was about a year or so until somebody, this street preacher from Texas, sent me a Paul Washer sermon. And how did you how of, did you meet a street preacher from Texas living in Washington? This is so crazy. So at this point, we had just left another assignment. We were in Bismarck, North Dakota for the first time. Our housing wasn't ready yet. So we're staying in a little hotel, this, this little hotel. It's got like a water park inside it, lots of fun things to go and do. And I'm in this prayer group because again, I'm, you know, I'm trying to earn my way to heaven. I'm going to be in a prayer mm. group, but I'm still posting things from like Joyce Meyer and Creflo Dollar. And this street preacher from Texas must have seen some of those posts and thought, you know what, maybe she needs to hear the gospel. And he sent me a Paul Washer sermon oh, jam wow. that had the gospel and it explained so Paul's conversion. That's quite a ways to go from Creflo Dollar to Paul Washer. I mean, that's, you'd get whiplash from that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's quite, a, quite a big shift. So what, I mean, was your jaw just dropped when you started watching, watching Paul Washer? Oh, absolutely. It was nothing I had ever heard before. This is the first time I was hearing the gospel ever. Um, and I was just like, oh my goodness. And I had the funniest response. I was like, this is what my husband's been looking for. I'm going to play this for him. And so I'm all excited. I finally found him answers and he gets home and I'm like, you have to listen to this. And I, and I you know, we, we watched it the second time I'm watching it. He's watching it for the first time. And as I'm watching it for the second time, I started thinking about how he must be feeling as he's listening to this. And so I started listening to it as if I was a sinner needing to be saved. Mm. Imagine that. <laughs> yes. So that second time, I'm personally convicted. As I'm listening to it, I'm like, oh, oh, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I don't hate my sin. I love my sin. I, I mean, I look forward to times whenever I'm alone so that I can have my own personal thought process of sin and pride and ego and lust. I knew that the second time I'm listening to this, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. And we watched video after video after video until it was nearly midnight. It's 4th of July. Everybody else was out, you know, having a blast. 4th of July, we're in this little hotel watching Paul Washer's sermon jam. Do you remember what the name of the first video was? Or can you send me the link? I don't remember what the exact video link was, but I I found some that were very similar. Anytime that he's telling the story of the pigs where, you know, if if you're a sinner or a false convert, you're eating the slop as a pig. Okay. But if kind, he could kind of like the finger, prodigal son. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I just had never heard anything like mm-hmm. that. Never heard anybody say, you know, your sin is the problem, right? Yeah. And so I turned to my husband and, and I said, I don't think I'm saved. And he said, oh, I know I'm not. Mm-hmm. And so I went to the rest, to the restroom, this little hotel. I went to the bathroom and I cried out to God. I didn't even know what to say. I just, you know, I don't deserve it. I deserve hell. I know I deserve hell. If you don't save me, I understand. <laughs> but please save me if you Mm -hmm. could, that'd be great. And I went to bed that night and I woke up the next morning and everything was brand new. It was, it was like waking up in a different life. The world was completely different. I didn't have um, sinful thoughts. Uh, I mean, I'm not perfect now, but I mean, Mm -hmm. the the difference would be 24 seven sinful thoughts before a lifestyle of sin, pride, selfishness. Oh my goodness. I was so selfish. I was just a very selfish person, very egotistical. I had absolutely no self-control whenever it came to like being gluttonous. I mean, you put a whole piece of pizza in front of me, I'm going to eat the whole thing. You know, Mm -hmm. I just, I had no, I had no, no um, self-control and the Holy Spirit gives those gifts. And so the difference was night and day. I had family that wasn't even near me, but just from talking to me on the phone, they were like, wow, this is, this is different. There's something different now. And So it was, it was so incredibly different that I was almost upset. I was angry at first. Mm -hmm. I found myself being very angry that I understand. no one told me. I know, right? (laughs) What a rip off all your whole life. (laughs) I hear you. Um, Let's, let's just pause for a moment and and unpack this Paul Washer, because I still get letters on Instagram from people who say that Paul Washer is teaching legalism and that it's saved by works. And, and I have to say, no, no, no. (laughs) Paul Washer is not saying you're saved by works. He's saying that you're, 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 when you are saved, you want to do good works, but you are not saved by good works because you, you lived this, you lived a saved by works 
mm -hmm. theology before. Absolutely. And then when you were genuinely saved, that's when you didn't have to pretend anymore. You had a, you got the new heart, mm -hmm. uh, the new life, the new person in Christ. Yeah. And, and so Paul Washer's teaching that it's evidence of salvation, right. not that you're saved by your works. Okay, no yeah. letters, please. <laughs> Unless you need more explanation on that. <laughs> That's an important distinction, though. I'm glad you pointed that out because uh, yeah. the big difference is the desire. I was reading scripture before I got saved. I didn't mm -hmm. want to, but I was doing it. I was going to church. I didn't want to, but I was doing it. After salvation, the, the best thing of my day was waking up and getting to go directly before the throne of God in prayer. I spent the first year having nightmares that my sin had returned, mm -hmm. and I would wake up crying, not not out of sorrow, but just out of pure joy, I would wake up crying. That was a dream. That's not real. It's not yeah. reality. There's this huge difference in your heart that you now desire righteousness. You desire fellowship. You desire uh, to learn about scripture, to learn about God. And the fact that you get to go before him in prayer, it just blew my mind. I just yeah. could not believe it. We can't talk to our president or any of our representatives but anytime we want, we get to go before the throne Isn't of God. That, amazing? that was Jesus on the cross doing that for us. Yep. And that the curtain of the tabernacle tearing uh, when he gave up his spirit for us. And, and now we have direct access to God as believers. Yep. It's just amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so and it sounds I didn't know any of that whenever I got saved and I hadn't had any of that explained. I didn't repeat a prayer. I, I didn't have any knowledge of the fact that that was even going to change. I had no scriptural knowledge. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it meant to be a new person. God, it was all of grace. God saved me. I didn't do anything yes. to earn it. Oh, and then the new person came about without me having any understanding of what it even meant. I mean, it would be a full year before I even understood any mm -hmm. of that stuff. So it was all of God. Yeah, there was no, there was no work that I did. No, it's completely our sovereign God who um, he just, in his mercy, saves wretched sinners like us and gives us a new heart and a new chance to live this life for whatever amount of time that he allows us to live and and glorify him absolutely <clears throat> my um my mom had a heart attack two months ago and um she was she's a christian scientist so you probably know this many people know i was raised christian science where you don't go to doctors and so my mom was just she had these health issues come up and we, we'd say my, my husband and my brother and I, mom, will you go to the doctor? And, um, and she'd say, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. And you know, she'd be reading her science and health books to try to heal herself. Uh, and it just kind of built up where my brother finally confronted her. You have to go to the doctor. So she went to the urgent care just to humor him. And, and they immediately put her in an ambulance and she immediately wow. was, um, they said she'd had two heart attacks and she would die if she didn't go to the hospital. So this was two months ago. And, oh um, and so, yeah, but, and so now she's on medication uh, and my husband and I are her caretaker. <laughs> well, it's been quite the journey. I've been yeah. praying for your mom. I meant to ask Thank that before you. how she was doing beforehand. I've been praying for oh, her. She's a brat. She's such a brat. <laughs> Every single day she complains about having to take medicine you know, no. because in, in the Christian science belief, it's, it's evidence you don't have faith in God if you take medicine. That's right. It's very either okay. or. And then she keeps asking the doctor if she can drive. And my brother and husband are like, don't let her drive. She can barely push a grocery cart straight. You know, oh, she's, my goodness. She's like this. But she's, you know, she's 86 years old. My dad's wow. 88 or 89. And, you know, they're at that age. So we're just trying to keep them safe in this COVID crisis. We don't, right. we don't let them out of the house without masks. And even then it's just quick trips to the doctor who now sees them in the parking lot, you know, to keep social wow. distancing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And That's crazy. It is. He's doing car trips. The doctor is. Yeah. <laughs> is that not happening there and where you live? Well, yeah. we're, we're doing um, FaceTimes for all of our appointments. Yes. We, we got calls from all of our doctors and they were all mm -hmm. like, your appointment is at such and such. Yeah. And I was like, can we always do FaceTime doctors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go get respiratory infections. Either. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Although my mom should have gone months and months ago and then it would have been yeah. easier instead of waiting to the very last minute. My goodness. Those when false doctrines are so dangerous. They're so dangerous. And you know, I, I went through that same anger that you did like, mm -hmm. 
why didn't anyone tell me growing up that Christian science is false? Why didn't anyone tell you that Wicca is not only false, false, but, you know, the doctrine of demons, both, we were both raised in doctrines of demons. Why did no one tell us? And I think it's that fear of offending people, Mm -hmm. or maybe they didn't know the gospel or a combination. Yeah, I think you're right. I think most of the people that I knew didn't know the gospel and coming to that realization, I mean, I wept and wept in prayer for hours and hours after I realized that, oh my goodness, all the people that I know then, they've never heard the gospel. So then of course, in my zeal as a new believer, I started telling everybody (laughs) and they would be so excited. And they were just like, calm down. You sound like a crazy person, (laughs) but no, you have to listen. This is important. (laughs) And so I I ended up probably doing more damage than good, but I definitely was like, but this is, this is what there was. This is the reason why you didn't tell me because you didn't know. Here's all the truth of the gospel. I was so excited. And, and a, a one particular family member was like, maybe you should get offline for a little while. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, okay. Ouch. Yeah. Well, so. you know, you plant seeds, though. I mean, it's not up to yeah. us to save people. Um, yeah, when you look back, if someone had told you the gospel when you were, say, 12 years old or 11, how do you think you would have reacted to it? You know, at 12, I think that I would have been at least more receptive to it. Mm -hmm. The, the harshness of the heart, I think comes on at an older age. So I I don't think that there's a limit for sharing the gospel with kids. If you, if you do have preteens or teens even, or young children, once, once they get into like high school and they start learning about evolution, they, they have more fodder for their, their disbelief, more reason to be um, less inclined to listen. So I think if somebody had come to me at 12 and just, ignoring the situation that I was in, maybe not directly saying, Hey, that witchcraft is, is bad. Maybe just saying your sin is bad. And this is why, because I remember asking, well, why did Jesus even have to die? Why not pick somebody less important? You know, why did it have to be the most important? I had that little bit of understanding. Like I didn't understand any of yeah, it. I didn't either. I, and I, I, I feel, I just repent for this. I used to say, but he would have died anyway. I mean, <laughs> oh, that makes sense because everybody dies. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. So I, I had no clue. I thought because in Christian Science, I was raised with that he's just a man, and then when I was in New Age, I bought into the whole New Age belief that he's this ascended master who's mm-hmm. the same as Buddha and Kuan Yin and and such. Right. And and people still write to me um, letters trying to teach me that it's oh. about Christ consciousness. Which I say, got the T-shirt. I used to believe that in the New Age too, you know. You've and, already been in that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I probably could tell them about the Christ consciousness, but it's it's really um, there was that fear of the Bible or that distrust of the Bible. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you went through that too, Lauren. Absolutely. Before yeah. you were saved. You hear that it's, you know, it's got contradictions. It was written by man. I heard all of that stuff, especially whenever I got into being um, in high school, I was hearing those, those things from other people. And then, you know, you go to church and you hear, at least in the new age or the Pentecostal churches, well, you just have to have faith. So, but wait, but wait, is there evidence that this is actually God's word? Because, you know, my Roman Catholic friends have more books in their Bible than ours do. Should I be listening to those books? Why don't we have that? And without those answers, it, it almost becomes like, th- this is just your preference. You just prefer to believe this. Well, what if I prefer to believe in Buddhism? What if I prefer to believe in atheism? Why not just have your own personal preference? And, but the, the truth is, is that there are answers to all of those questions. Mm-hmm. I just wasn't getting them. And I think that if we have biblically sound teaching at a young age, that it, it, it's not going to necessarily save any of these kids because only God can make that choice, mm-hmm. but it'll at least set them up to not be distracted by the things that they learn as older kids. Cause I had that same issue. I didn't trust it. It was written by men. I was raised by a feminist, right? I was hearing feministic stuff. Why would I want to listen to a bunch of men? Mm-hmm. And, and so it really snowballs from there. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, there's, there's no telling how, how much further I have a family member right now that's straight into new age witchcraft right now. And Mm. that's because whenever they were young, they heard these questions. They asked these questions. This particular family member asked about dinosaurs. Why, you know, if 
if the Bible was written by God, why doesn't it talk about dinosaurs? Where do the dinosaurs fit in? And when nobody had an answer, they turned their back on, on church altogether. Mm, they didn't want to hear about it after that. There yeah, are so. dinosaurs in, in the book of Job. I know. I love that. <laughs> Behemoth I love and Leviathan. That. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, that's an easy answer. Mm -hmm. So how, how simple that was. And right after that, if you were talking to a young person asking that, you could segue straight into the gospel. Especially oh my goodness. Job. Yeah. yeah. Book of Job just takes you right there. Yeah. That well, sinfulness of man, the yeah, sovereignty of God. Yeah, right. It's all there. And evil in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so, so after you saw the Paul Washer video, what happened? I mean, obviously your life changed, but did your church change? Did your practices change? Yeah. You know, right away um, at the very beginning, I sort of swung directly into like Hebrew uh, roots, I think is what it's called. There's a movement where you're celebrating the you're celebrating the Shabbat and the different things. And I was like fascinated by the, the historicity of the church that we had this huge history and it went back and, and I got into that at first. Um, God's gracious. And he almost immediately pulled me right on out of that and into a good solid Bible teaching church that um, was teaching exegetically straight mm -hmm. through scripture. And my husband was very patient with me. I just have to say this, that if you're a husband out there and your, your wife is a new believer, my husband was so patient. He was so kind to me. I'm like saying, Hey, listen, we can't shop on Sunday. That makes no sense because right. the Sabbath isn't even on Sunday. Right. right. <laughs> so I was, I was trying to figure out the scriptures and I was learning and he was very gracious. He would learn right next to me. He would send me sermons. He never just said flat out, listen, this is nonsense. You need to understand this way. But he asked me questions that had me questioning the teachers that were teaching this and and so within a few months, I was able to say, okay, well, that's definitely not it. I got to find out what is it? You know, where's, where's the church that's going to teach biblically? And the only way to do that was to get all of this new age, all of these uh, Wiccan beliefs, all of this Pentecostal word of faith stuff out of my brain and really study scripture. And I just delved into scripture as hard as I could. And we found a good solid church. Of course, I'm listening to Paul Washer at the same time. Mm, yeah. And then from listening to Paul Washer, a friend of mine sent me uh, the Strange Fire Conference. Oh, John MacArthur's conference. That That's fantastic. Was huge. Yeah. yeah. That was like six months after I got saved. Uh -huh. And that helped me tremendously with understanding where the disconnect was with what we were learning and where scripture is there. And I had this motto at the time, if I, if I had learned it, I need to relearn it. Mm -hmm. If I thought it was true or believed it was true, I needed to find out if it was actually true in scripture. And so any thought that would come to my brain, like if I thought, okay, but what about tithing? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what I've learned about tithing. Is that accurate scripturally? And I would tear that down and I would look into scripture and see. And, and having an exegetical uh, church where the pastor is going verse by verse was tremendously helpful with yes. that. So I did start with um, like a reformed leaning church. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what, re like what reformed theology was at the time. I'd never mm -hmm. heard of that. But I did look at like, where's the John MacArthur church? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and so that was helpful. I found a church where there was, um, it was like a Baptist church where they leaned reformed. And, mm -hmm. and then I found, um, found real, real reformed churches, actual reformed churches after reading um, Calvin's Institutes, which was very, very helpful. All the while, my, my sweet husband, he is so supportive. He's like buying books and, and, <laughs> videos, anything that I need to help me along with this. You can see my collection. Yeah. <laughs> it's from eBay. You can get them cheaper there. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. They yeah. charge quite a bit for those big collections. But yeah. Eventually we found ourselves in, in reformed faith and I'm so thankful for that. Um, it, it's great to be in a group of people that mm -hmm. so respect God's word mm -hmm. and, and so care about God's attributes about his holiness, about his sovereignty and, and yes. things of that nature. But it took a few years before, mm -hmm. even still to this day, when I get sick, I'm like, man, I better not tell anybody. Wait, mm -hmm. no, I don't have yes. to feel that way. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a big change to come out of that dark of deception into mm -hmm. God's light. And, um, and it makes us appreciate it even more. But one other thing it makes us do, Lauren, I'm sure you can relate to this is you can spot New Age deception, maybe for you Absolutely. also Wiccan deception, um, where other people may not be able to see it. Absolutely. It's, it's like 
I, I mean, I hate to use this, this same um, example, but like if you smoked and then you stop smoking, yes. you can smell cigarette smoke from, from anywhere around. I never smoked, but growing up, my, my mom always did. And so I can smell it from other cars when they're mm. driving by. Like I can, I can tell that somebody's in there smoking. And it's like that with this stuff. If you, if you hear somebody say something, you're instantly like your antenna goes up. You're like, wait a minute. Let me find the context of what they're saying. And, and this has been helpful for me too. If you are coming out of this and you're going into Christian groups, if you're, if you're trying to learn and understand, being really clear with your questions. And then when you see somebody say something that you're like, wait a minute, I heard so-and-so say that and they were a false teacher. Find out the context between what somebody's saying because words don't mean the same in these different groups. Right. The words that we used in the Word of Faith movement or even growing up, the words that I would hear in, in, the, in the Wiccan books that I would, was reading, those books contain words that you might hear in a church setting, mm -hmm. but they mean something completely, completely different. different. Yep. Yeah. So before I jumped on somebody, I had to figure out what they were actually talking about. Yeah. And then are they saying what I think they're saying or are they saying something biblical? Mm -hmm. And that's been a big help too. And, and, and if I could just give this encouragement really quickly for uh, people who've been in the faith for a long time, when you see new believers coming up, and they are asking these questions, whether it's in Facebook or a different social media group, be kind and patient. I see a lot of these new people coming up, they're asking questions and they're almost attacked by these older Christians. Like, yeah. why do you want to know? Well, what do you believe? What do you think? Well, just, just take a deep breath and be kind and patient with this person. At least they're asking. That's right. They're trying to learn. So hopefully we can, I, my, my heart in a lot of what we do on the podcast is to, to help people understand that being kind and patient, it's, it's going to garner you a lot more fruit than being aggressive, um, especially with a newer believer, because mm -hmm. sometimes we don't really understand words. No. <laughs> and for me, it took so long to get the new age thoughts mm -hmm. out. I still, I was blending new age with Christianity for probably a year after yeah. I was saved and I didn't even realize it. And right. having Christians come alongside you is so important for support. Yeah, so speaking absolutely. of that, can people write to you? You've got your contact details right here on the screen. Can they yeah, send absolutely. you messages and bug you about all this? I, I hope they do. Absolutely. I love to get emails or messages from people that have questions. We, as, much as, as much as I'm able to at, answer mm -hmm. questions, I do. You can email me or you can find uh, my contact information is all at our website, uh, fivesolas.online. Or you can find me on social media and, and message me. Let me know if you have questions or anything like that. Or if you just need prayer, if you're dealing with this and you're, you're having a hard time, like you just came out. I love finding people like that that are like, I just, you know, I just got saved. I'm coming out of deception. Everything is overwhelming at that point. Yeah. You're just, you're bombarded with the fact that you don't know. The first verse, I meant to tell you this when we were talking about the first verse I opened up to read on, after I got saved that very next day, July 5th of 2015 was that um, second Corinthians where it says, those who think they know, know not what they ought. Yeah. And <laughs> talk about a life verse. <laughs> yeah, that's humbling. <laughs> it's how it feels still uh -huh. today. But you know, if you're, if you're in those situations, if you want to contact us, absolutely anything that we can do to pray for you or to help mm -hmm. um, get, get some, we're always giving away books, anything that we can do to help people uh, grow in, in their knowledge of Christ. So absolutely, please reach out to us. We, we love that. And we have a group too on Facebook uh -huh. and the group is wonderful at answering questions. So if I don't know oh. a question, if I don't know the answer and you ask the question in the group, there's like people that have been saved longer than I've been alive and they can help too. So it's been What's really the name of your group on Facebook? It's uh, Tulips and Honey Hub. So there's a Tulips and Honey Hub page and then there's a Tulips and Honey Hub group. So the hub is, um, our podcasting channel. We have other podcasts on our channel. So the hub is kind of for everybody to use. So uh -huh. you get the benefit of, of all of the people that are on the channel, as well as all of our listeners that, that have just, we've had people come on that were sort of new to, um, to solve theology. And I love seeing their questions. They ask the best questions. Oh, good. Fantastic. And, and there's no, um, uh, kind of word of faith going on in the group or anything like that. It's just all solid. Yes. Yeah. So we have, we have some, some rules about things like that. Mm -hmm. We make sure that we, we vet people before they start questioning or answering questions and things like that. And I have several admins that these oh, women good. are such a blessing to me. They go through all the questions and they make sure that nothing is happening. That's outside of our purview. We have like a no trolling zone. 
You're oh, not wow. allowed to troll people in our group because <laughs> we know it's, it's discouraging if you're just yes. asking a normal question. And so we, we call it passing over. If you see something that you may not perfectly agree with, if it's not mm-hmm. sinful, you just don't like the way it was phrased. We say, pass over that. If, mm-hmm. if there's something that you don't like, you can message that person personally, or you can pass over it, but don't troll them in the comments. Below. Right, right. And look at what's primary issues and what's secondary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that's that's so important. It's uh, been a, it's been helpful in the group to stop the boy the arguing and stuff that happens on social media. Yes, it does. There's a lot of arguing <laughs> about email and dispensationalism. And oh, right. Charles Spurgeon said that the devil equally goes after Calvinists and Arminians. <laughs> he doesn't care about <laughs> the secondary issues. He's like. Come with me. Yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, Spurgeon knew how to put it, didn't he? He was very blunt and bold. And of course, mm-hmm. sounds like he's inspired both of us. And absolutely. and so is there anything else you'd like to leave people with? Is there anything that someone watching maybe who is kind of still trying to blend New Age or Wicca with Christianity? Anything you want to say? Yeah, um, I, I think that the encouragement that I would want to give somebody that's dealing with that is to to understand that there's an absolute truth. There's not your truth and my truth. The scripture is opposed to these things. The scripture is very clear, just like Doreen was saying earlier about Deuteronomy 18. It's clear all throughout scripture that God is sovereign and we're not to have anything to do with those things. It it might feel more friendly or loving to, to mix these things. It might even help you feel a little bit better about your sin or about what you've been through. Sometimes whenever we've done these things, admitting that they were wrong and backing away from them can be really difficult, but that's what we're called to do. And we're not doing it alone. If you're a believer, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you have the Holy spirit that's there to help you. And you're also not doing it alone. Doreen and all the other wonderful women that have gone through this alongside you, they're all out there as well. Understand that there's, there's the absolute truth of God's word and you have to separate from everything else, especially if it's uncomfortable. Listen, I've taught this to my daughter since she was old enough to talk. Doing the right thing is still the right thing when it's uncomfortable. So especially if it's uncomfortable, do the right thing. And that's true for, for theology. We want to make sure that we keep the truth separated from the lies. There's, there's nothing that um, Jerusalem has to do with, with uh, what is it, Rome or Egypt. Like we, we don't intermix pagan ideas with Christianity. People are, um, they they need to hear the gospel and they're lost. And this, even if you understand there's a difference, not making sure that you split, split the two can confuse other people as well. So we want to make sure that we're really clear with everything that we say and do, especially on social media where it's never going to go away and it'll be there forever, never people to see. Yeah. We don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. And absolutely. So that's well put. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing your Um, amazing testimony. Praise the Lord for saving you and for Jesus opening our eyes and, and I just really appreciate what all that you're doing and, and please do the links are below uh, in the description and you can read them right there next to Lauren. We hope that you'll visit her social media. And again, she says she's open to being uh, available for contact and for support. So that's very generous of you. Thanks again for this. Let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Doreen. And thank you for everything that you do for, for the Christian m- women's ministry. Oh. You've been a, such a blessing to all of us. Oh. I hear from my listeners all the time that you're, you're, just a, you're just a blessing. Your voice is very calming, too. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you for thank everything you, you do, glory sister. To God. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. 